Hello gardeners and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. We're glad that you have tuned in and we're gonna talk about plants and whatever is happening in the garden right now. So do stay tuned. My name is Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture during the school year at the University of Illinois in the Crop Sciences Department. So I'll, I'll handle cut flowers and maybe perennials and et cetera. But we also have three knowledgeable, highly intelligent, and just really interesting people here with me today. So let's find out who they are and they'll do some emails or show and tells as well. So I'm first gonna throw it over to you, Shane Coulter. Thanks, Diane. I'm Shane Coulter. I'm one of the co-owners of Country Arbors Nursery in Urbana and we grow plants of all types. We grow perennials, annuals, shrubs, trees, and so I can answer any questions about that. I just realized that I've been on the show for 22 years, even though I hopefully don't look like I'm old enough to have been on the show that long. But uh, so all, what I do all day is answer questions. And so t uh, today I can do that as well. You were seven, so that makes you 29. Exactly, I was just a young I was child trying to there. do the math. Okay. Being on the Tiger Woods of garden questioning. That's right. Yeah. Well, hey, what's all this beautiful stuff you yeah, brought Yeah, so for today us? I brought uh, a plant. I, you know, honestly didn't realize how much I liked it until at the garden center, every house I went into, I noticed there was one plant I liked and it turned out all to be verbena, just different colors and different types of it. So I purchased, or purchased, I brought in uh, a whole flat of all the different colors and there's just a great mix of colors and verbenas. And there's, you know, different combinations within the plant, the pastels and the reds and the darks, and they just really are easy to grow. They flower all summer long and they're really, you know, not too expensive. So uh, that combination is always good when it comes to plants. and. Yeah, they're going to die at the end of the year, but what kind of plant gives you from, you know, April all the way into late September of just full of color? And you could do one color or you could do a beautiful mixture just the way you have it here. It's, I, I took the picture of that and it's now my screensaver on my phone. You know it's good when it becomes a screensaver Ooh, on your phone. Yeah, so. <laughs> from a nurseryman. Ooh, yeah. look out. Well, good. Thank you for bringing those. They look great. They'll stay here for a while. Water them, please. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> all right. Well, let's go to Kay Carnes in the middle. Um, I'm Kay Carnes and I'm a Champaign County Master Gardener. Um, my <clears throat> areas of interest are herbs, uh, vegetables, seed saving, and some perennials. Um, and I brought tonight, um, this is a, one of my many favorite herbs, it's called Summer Savory. Um, there's actually two different savories. The Summer Savory is an annual and then there's a perennial called Winter Savory. Um, the summer savory I like a little better than the winter savory um, <clears throat> and, you, and you can see it's kind of a tall rangy plant it flops over um, and so I have actually cut it back so it'll bush out a mm -hmm. little more um, you can cut them and <clears throat> dry them or use them fresh anytime during the growing season um, later on they'll start to flower and kind of like basil um, I'll cu keep cutting it back when it flowers to keep it growing and lasting a little longer and it dries quite nicely um, it's used a lot with beans and potatoes uh, and of course meat um, it's excellent with meat the winter savory is a little bit uh, and the summer savory has kind of a peppery thyme flavor to it the winter savory is a little stronger um, and the leaves are a little pointed and kind of sharp um, and that's used a lot with game um, because it'll take the gaminess out of the meat. So um, I like that description of peppery thyme. Yeah, it's kind of a different little flavor but yeah. I really like it a lot. Yeah, I like growing summer savory from seed. I don't remember to do it every year. I know. Mine's, <laughs> mine's late this year, so I broke down And I down didn't and do it this year. <laughs> so I really appreciate seeing your summer savory. Thank you, Kay. And now, Jim Schuster, let's go to you next. Okay. Yeah. As I said, I'm Jim Schuster. I'm a retired plant pathologist and horticulturist with the University of Illinois Extension. And I'm going to do an email. And the one I've got just says evergreen, but based on the pictures, it is an Austrian pine. They have several of these and they inherit the property with the trees already on it and they are not doing too well. They are roughly 25 years old and they are definitely sick. Uh, they uh, have a disease that was called the Plodia, then got its name changed to Chiropsis. Now they're calling it the Plodia again. Uh, How do you spell, you're saying? Diplodia, D-I-P. 
P L O D I A. That's what I thought you were saying. Yeah, this is the one, that, and the picture that's now showing uh, shows the more of the dead tips, which is typical of this disease. And uh, as a tree ages, it gets more and more of the disease, and it's very hard to keep under control when it's there this bad looking. Uh, one of the controls will be to prune all the dead off, and especially the dead tips. It mostly starts on the new growth as it's emerging. And part of the reason for that is it overwinters on the sheath around those branches, it overwinters on the needles on the tree, whether they're dead or alive, and it overwinters on the branches and trunk, and you know it's going to be fatal then. Uh, and it also overwinters on pine cones, green and brown. And one pine cone will have more spores on it than all the rest of the tree if you leave out all the other pine cones. So as the tree ages and it gets more and more pine cones, the volume of inoculum just goes up and up and up, which is why the tree resistance just falls apart, because it can't cope with that. And if you were going to try and treat it, you have to get it when it first starts. And that, you know you start watching when the tree is about 15 to 20 years of age, and then you would spray with two, uh, one or two products. One is propiconazole, and the other one is triphenonate Azole, and I'll try and spell them for you. Oh, good, thank you. P R O P I C O N A Z O L E. O L E, sorry. That's propiconazole. The triphanidate azole is T as in Tom, H I O, P as in Paul, H A N A T E, A Z O L E. None of those are brand names. You're going to have to look under the ingredients to see if you can find it. And you're going to also spray three times. The first time uh, you're going to spray when the buds begin to swell or elongate. The second one is just as the shoot is starting to emerge. And the third one is 10 to 14 days later. That's quite involved. Mm -hmm. But I can't believe that about the pine cone having all that inoculum. Oh boy. Mm. Wow. Not good news nope. at that stage. All right, well, let's go to our special Did You Know segment next. House plants like the asparagus fern are considered toxic to cats. True ferns are less dangerous, but that doesn't mean you should let your cat nibble them. If your cat consumes part of a fern, call your vet immediately. Cats are always doing interesting things. So <laughs> anyway, ferns are not always ferns. I mean, they might have that in the name, so be careful about that. Okay, let's go to line two, and Logan has a question that's very interesting about plants. Logan, what's your question? Hi, Diana. I was uh, at shopping at a plant center the other day, and I got to know a conversation with a woman, and she was reluctant to plant onions next to her tomatoes because she thought they might impart a flavor. She was also worried about garlic and other strong flavored vegetables. I didn't think that would be a problem, but it got me to wondering, are there any plants which do not play well together either in the vegetable garden or in the flower garden where they inhibit growth or have some sort of bad effect on each other? And I'll just listen. Well, I was going to look at Kay. This sounds well, a little there, bit. You know, there's a whole thing about companion planting, where some plants do better next to other plants, um, and there I don't, you know, I don't really strictly adhere to that, but it it kind of works. So I, um, because some plants will attract beneficial insects that the other plant can benefit from, or something like that. Um, I think there are some plants that don't do well together. If you, if you, I have questions about it, I just Google it. Um, I did have one website, and I've totally forgotten which one it was, but it listed a whole long list of companion uh, plants. I mean, Ohio State, I mean, University of Ohio has a list of plants that will interfere with other plants like vegetables and that. And it, is, it covers shrubs, and it covers the trees, yes. and it covers other herbaceous plants that just don't do well. Okay. So you may want to go up to the Ohio, University of Ohio's website, College of Agriculture, and see if you can find that. Yeah. And look for the companion I mean, list. A, cl a very classic case is black walnut trees. Right. You know, exactly. A lot of things will not grow 
Mm -hmm. uh, went round. But. A lot of people tend to think what are good neighbors. So mm -hmm. that's an interesting question. What makes bad neighbors? Yeah, I've never heard the onion and the tomatoes. No, I, no, I, 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 I don't. I don't think. And I don't uh, think one would impart. No, that doesn't no, sound that scientifically no. possible. Yeah. But I can see the smells and step every time you go in your garden. I've but, heard yeah. people planting chives near roses to try to mm -hmm. keep yeah. away insects from the roses. Yeah. But I don't, but I don't think taking on the flavor. It's yeah, not. You know, it's, you're not cooking in not the garden. Gonna, literally, right. okay. it's not so. going to impart. But it's worth looking at the other examples mm -hmm. you know that the University of Ohio might have so interesting uh, thought-provoking question Logan thank you very much well let's go on to our next question and Bill on line four has a question about Christmas cactus hi Bill hello um, yeah I've uh, inherited a couple of uh, cactus and I think what I've done is put a, uh, a Thanksgiving cactus and a Christmas cactus together in one pot and it'll start blooming before Thanksgiving, and it'll bloom through the end of January. But I've had it in the same pot for quite a while, and I want to repot it into a bigger one. And I don't, you know, like what kind of, uh, I use just a, um, uh, uh, just some soil, some perlite, uh, fertilizer, anything like that, and how much bigger of a pot can I put it in without bothering? Okay, good questions. I mean, we get that all the time. Um, it's funny because we pot up so many plants, we kind of take for granted what, how easy it is. Mm -hmm. But basically, I, I, maybe you'll be able to share a rule of thumb as how much bigger, but I can look at a pot and I generally increase it by 25% uh, when it comes to the next size up. You don't want too much mm -hmm. bigger a pot mm -hmm. because then it'll take on a lot of water and the roots um, won't reach the end very quickly, so you, you'll over, tend to overwater it. You don't want it too small because you don't want to put something in barely bigger than the one you had. You don't always have to repot. That's the thing. A lot of people just assume because of time frame that you need to move to the next big pot. But if it's, it's a successful plant that's doing well, it's okay to leave it in the same pot. I've seen bone size in the same pots for 100 years. Uh, you know? my, my Christmas uh, cactus has been in the same pot for 50 years. Yeah, so 50 mm. years in the same. And I like the idea of a Thanksgiving and Christmas cactus yeah. together. That yeah. sounded really yeah. nice. Yeah, put them to, yeah, you get blooms all the time. But mm. if you want to. My yeah. Christmas cactus was blooming at Thanksgiving and didn't stop blooming until February. Wow. Yeah. But if you do, wow. if you, as far as the soil, you know, there's a lot of good potting mixes that you can use. The Christmas cactus are fairly forgiving. You do want it well drained, nothing too heavy. Uh, it, it's gonna that's gonna soak up a lot of moisture, and you don't want a like a heavy bark or something super well drained that you can't keep it watered. So just a general potting mix for a Christmas cactus, and they're really easy to propagate. We we borrowed a, a hundred year old one from somebody and took cuttings, and that's what we sell off of that one plant. So they're very easy to grow. That's a great one to repot and do yourself, and not have to worry it too, about it too much. But we do have a lot of customers that are really scared of that process, and it's not as difficult as they, they may think. They're pretty resilient. The only rule of thumb I've ever heard about repotting is not doing it going into winter because yeah. it wants to stimulate growth. And if you don't have a greenhouse, that's bad. And this but is now a good is a time. Perfect time. Yeah, really right, good time yeah. to repot. Yeah. Okay, very good. Thank you for your question. And let's go on to line five. Ron has a question about hibiscus. Hi there, Ron. Hi. I have a althea bush that's about four years old. Uh, I bought it when it was maybe two to three foot tall. It'll bud out, but then the buds never open up to, for the bloom. What can I do to get the, the buds to open up? I've never had that problem before. I get, I, I'm going to be honest, I get the question all the time, year. and I, I'm not mm -hmm. sure exactly of the answer. Exactly last what's year, going. a lot of people mentioned that. Yeah. That a, 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 Did anybody you, have an answer? I was going to say, do you fertilize? Yeah. You may have to speak in yeah. generalities yeah. then. Yeah, because uh, sometimes if you put a lot of fertilizer in, uh, on the ground or in the pot with the plant, just as it's starting to set buds, uh, the fertilizer may stimulate foliage growth and stem growth, and it'll screw up the flowering. Uh, so, you know, and sometimes to get the best flowering, you want your plant slightly hungry, and you would feed it real early in the year or after, after, flowering. Yeah, after flowering, depending on what kind of hydrangea you got and when it blooms. I wonder, too, if... Did he have a hardy Hibiscus it was an althea. Yeah, he said summer, so it has yeah. to be yeah. probably a 
later one. A tropical. No, not a tropical, oh, but uh, like a Rosa Sharon oh, type. That's what I was thinking, Rosa yeah. Sharon. Yeah. yeah I wonder, are the, do they have a heat response that they would drop? Yeah, I mean, they do. They know. do often change when they're going to bloom. I mean, they, you know, they're always August, September, but there's years it's early August. Mm -hmm. There's years it's late September. But we did have a couple of people say um, that they swelled and got to that point, but they never and opened from that. So a lot of people, and I don't recall yeah, what I, the. Um, I wish I had the answer for that one. I so don't recall I'm the answer. I'm not serving my purpose that, here. <laughs> there <laughs> was an answer even. The other thing I would be asking. What how, moisture level did they have at the time of a sudden, you know, didn't they have a drought mm -hmm. or whatever? Yeah, I mean, stress of some mm -hmm. sort would definitely stop the, uh, the right. finishing process. Um, but it, it has to be something weather related. When you get two or three people that come in and ask a question mm -hmm. that are in completely different parts of the county and probably exactly. not doing all the same thing, there's probably some weather things setting up that, that yeah. might affect the way it blooms. But that's easy. It's too easy of an answer. So I'd like to try and get more detail normally. <laughs> okay, so we'll do our best. Yeah, we'll hear, we're gonna we're gonna have to it. do a little research. <laughs> okay, well we have a question about a Norway spruce with Harold on line three. Hi there, Harold. Hello. What's your question? Well, I have an established Norway spruce uh, windbreak, and uh, uh, the candles came out nice. And uh, now a lot of them are turning brown, and I just I don't understand uh, what the problem might be. How old are they? They're established. Yeah, I mean, well, are they 25, 30 years old, or are they 10? Well, they're uh, more like 20 feet tall. So that'd be roughly 20 years of age. Yeah. Norway spruce are resistant to diplodia, but they still get it. They're not immune. And when you said that the tips were dying, that's the typical place where Diplodia starts. So look at the base of that candle, where it you know, connects with last year's growth, and see if you see sap oozing out, and if that stem is starting to get a darker color to it. And if that's what you're seeing, you definitely have Diplodia, and you would want to try and spray with those uh, products I mentioned before. And I'm going to dumb it down a lot more than that. We just had a ton of rain that forced out a lot of new growth. And then we got dry and we had heavy, heavy winds mm -hmm. and it burnt mm -hmm. the heck out of the tips of a lot of big spruce. Mm -hmm. So all those, that new growth that was so lush and fresh just got hit with 30 to 40 mile an hour winds and it was breaking the wind and it, it dried up. And I know it because our fields have a lot of dry, new flushed growth. And, uh, so they have pruned. The, they have been pruned, basically. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, ba yeah, <laughs> basically. Now that should. Yeah. If, if I'm hoping it's more my case than Jim's, but if that's the case, it will just die off, and then it'll set new growth and keep so going. So it could be yeah. either or. Yeah. <laughs> well, I like say both. Yeah. With his, there will be no oozing sap in that's the base. True, exactly. yeah. Mine will have the oozing yeah. sap. Yeah. <laughs> and you will know from that. Hopefully, no yeah. oozing. Okay. All right. Well, with that, let's go on to Charlotte's question on line two, and it's about a walnut. Hi, Charlotte. Hi. Uh, actually, it's not a question. It's kind of a statement. Okay. We bought our house here 20 years ago, a big old Victorian in Paxton, and I mentioned to somebody that there were 11, actually there were 13 black walnut trees in the yard. Everybody's comment was nothing will grow under that. Well, as we <laughs> got used to the yard and everything, every year day lilies just thick come up around the base of every one of those walnut trees, I think, except one. And every year we have lots and lots and lots of daylilies growing under those walnut trees. Now, I can't explain it, but when people say, make the comment that nothing will grow under them, it hasn't bothered those daylilies a bit. <laughs> Not Excellent. All, yeah. It isn't so much that nothing will grow. Some, yeah. A lot of plants, I have a spider wart plant that's under one of my, grows out right at the base. Um, so some plants will, but a lot of plants don't. So it's the tough ones yeah. are spider wart and daylilies, <laughs> daylilies. that are yeah, able to handle so far. Are the, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> and every tree is different. You know, it's about the juglins that it releases. Mm -hmm. Some trees are just brutal and they just, you know, nothing will grow under it. And there's other ones where people try all kinds of things and they actually survive mm -hmm. and it just you, until it starts releasing more uh, toxins. But, you know, the, the saying that I always like to say is the, the best plant underneath the walnut's a cheat plant. And it just came up. Sometimes it's self-sown yeah. and 
other ways brought <laughs> into your garden. Day, if you, yeah, daylilies are pretty tough. Uh, you could drop the daylily off at the back of your car on the way home, and it would probably still be growing on the road when you get back. So <laughs> it's a pretty good one to put under there. Okay, well, we're going to sneak in a few emails next. And uh, Shane, do you have something for us? Yeah, so I, I re or we received a question about, uh, this is my pathetic-looking hydrangea. It's had it for five years. It was a store-bought hydrangea, and uh, I made the mistake out of, of cutting it back, and they wanted some tips about it. Uh, I laughed at the store-bought store because most hydrangeas aren't dug up anymore, so I thought, well, if you don't get it at the store, where would you? But I think they <laughs> meant like a floral type hydrangea because there are, oh. that's, there are lots of that are in full bloom and lots, lots of different colors, um, and I agree with you, it looks pretty pathetic, but uh, hydrangeas are pretty easy to grow. It's all about where you put them in conditions but it looks like you've had it in a pot for five years. So I'm guessing that you've gotten it to survive, that it's a floral hydrangea by bringing it inside. And really the best way, they're never gonna look fantastic when you bring them inside, but when you bring them outside, if you put them in the shade with a tiny bit of sun, lots of fertilizer, uh, good regular watering, you can look, make it look a lot better than that and probably keep it looking lush and healthy as a plant itself. And I'm hoping the picture of the flower is one that you got. So you can get it to bloom, but I don't think it's going to be one, judging by the picture, that you can put out in your yard, plant it, let it get big like you would buy at a garden center. Um, it's just not that type of hydrangea. So when you are buying hydrangeas, make sure it's a landscape hydrangea, not just a floral gift type hydrangea. Right. Okay. Thank you. And next, Kay. Okay. I have a... <clears throat> question from a listener that says, uh, when do we fertilize asparagus? I missed last year, I think. Mine didn't do well. Um, well, uh, you could probably uh, fertilize about any time, uh, <clears throat> but especially in the spring, uh, early spring or during the winter. Mm -hmm. um, I like to just put a layer of compost over it. Um, make sure it's weeded. If you do miss it, you know, you can do it now. Um, just weed it really well and then just put a good thick layer of compost on it and uh, that should help. Okay, so just so you get it, probably more after it's done and right. picked. But Ideally, like I said, you should do yes. it during the but winter. But if that's when you remember it, but yeah. <laughs> I try to remember it more in winter yeah. as well. Okay, thank you and now Jim. Okay, <clears throat> this person has 20 white pines growing in a row. Um, they're not wide enough to be a really good windbreak, but one of the 20 is dying. And I look at the picture and I'm wondering um, one of two possibilities. The one on the left looks like the branches are closer to the ground than the one on the right. And if that is true, because your br bottom branches should be at least six inches above the soil line. And if not, the tree is in too deep and long term, that is a way to kill off the roots, and that would be about the right age for that to happen. Another possibility is white pine sometimes just croak. No reason why. They just decide I can be 10 years old, I can be 50 years old. I just decide I'm going to die tomorrow. Okay? <laughs> you can't find anything on them. No insects, no diseases, nothing in the environment says they should die. I've seen that over and over in my 50 some years looking at them. Uh, and one other thing is, white pine's natural habitat is sandy soils well, that is moist but well drained. And we don't have that in Illinois, except for up in the one county in north uh, central Illinois, and that's where the last natural white pine forest is still in Illinois. Hmm. Interesting. So people who think they have caused it, and you have found that sometimes there is absolutely no reason. Nope. I mean, you can, you know, sometimes I say, okay, is it the soil drainage, is it too dry, too wet? And sometimes you can't determine that because right. it's not showing those t kind of symptoms that would say, this definitely is this. Uh, but anyway, it, I would still check the environment out. Too but wet, too dry. interesting. It did look like the branches were closer to the ground on the one on the left that was right. yellowed. So right. that's a very good thing to look at first mm -hmm. to see if that's the case. Um, we keep having windbreak questions, and I keep thinking, try to have diversity in your windbreaks. Try yep. to have yeah. more than one, maybe three or five kinds of trees. That's, I just think you have a better chance of not having them all. Yeah. And these were not all dying out at once, no. but it's just better to have variety. So that's my plug for windbreaks, and also not to limb them up, because they're windbreaks. So 
those are my two things I <laughs> like to tell everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and try not to plant anything under a windbreak. That's what a windbreak's for, is to cover the ground. Did I cover everything on windbreaks? I Some think so. I think Somehow so. I just had to get on a soapbox about windbreaks <laughs> all of a sudden. Well, the show does go so fast, and we really appreciate our viewers. Uh, we are coming up celebrating 25 years, and we love doing all of the the questions from you viewers. So thank you so much for being good viewers for 25 years. I want to thank you three for being here. Oh, thank you. We thank bring you. all of the latest things in and people are asking all those same kind of questions. So we thank you for watching. We hope that you'll get out and garden and hopefully it'll be a perfect day for you. And we ho hope that you have a great week gardening. See you next time. Goodbye.